distinct pleasure to be introducing uh, my dear friend, my role model, and my karmic brother, Matthew David Seagal. Seagal. Um, <laughs> Seagal. Yeah, um, as long as you spell it right. <laughs> I have, which I had nothing to do with. Um, Matt's one of the only people uh, around my age that I actually see as a true philosopher. Um, not only does he have an uncanny ability to subsume and convey ideas with absolute crystal clarity, if I ever want to know more about any particular idea, and that's usually the person I go to, not only can I get the gist of it very well, but I can zoom in and just get nitpicky about it and really inform myself on that. Bells and whistles, I guess. Um, <laughs> and Matt's also just a great example of uh, how to show up in community. I see that in him all the time. Uh, how much he shows up, how much he really cares, and doesn't call a lot of attention to himself. He's probably about it. Um, and as many of you know, and some of you may not know, he blogs regularly at footnotes to Plato.com. I highly recommend checking it out. You'll learn something new and probably think some brand new thoughts. So without further ado, that's it. Did I break it? No problem. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hi. Thanks for sticking around all afternoon and uh, staying strong with us through all these really interesting talks. Um, I kind of wish I could have gone later in the week because I've just noticed in the last two days how much all the other talks, starting with Rick's and Theo's and Jahan's and Travis's and Jessica's, are setting the ground for a lot of what I want to say. So my task is a lot easier than it would have been. And I imagine if I had waited till Thursday to go, it would have been even even easier. It's really fascinating and humbling to see how much we're all on the same page. And hopefully, I'll try to point out the resonances as I go along here with everyone else's presentations. So the title here is. Um, evolutionary panpsychism or eliminative materialism. And this this uh, title comes from um, the chapter of a, uh, the, the title of a chapter in a book by um, a philosopher and media theorist named Stephen Shapiro and he's part of this philosophical movement um, you could call it that just emerged in the last several years called speculative realism and he's sort of throwing Whitehead's hat uh, into the arena uh, discussion. Speculative realism is a very diverse community of thinkers. I'll, I'll explain what they share in a minute, but is really carrying the Whiteheadian torch and saying that um, we need to pay attention uh, to this man's ideas. He was ahead of his time, and he can help us imagine the way forward into a more ecological civilization. Um, the subtitle then is Towards an Anthro Decentric Philosophy of Nature. And so this word anthro decentrism has to do with getting over anthropocentrism, decentering the human. And that's really where all of the speculative realists, whether it's Shaviro and others that I'll mention that I'm getting to more as this talk is long, like Graham Harmon and uh, Ray Brassier, uh, Ian Hamilton Grant. They all want to decenter the human. They all want to critique um, what they call philosophies of human access, which really began with Kant, where the whole issue for philosophy became more epistemological, and everyone focused after Kant on how human beings have access to reality, and that developed into phenomenology as the dominant school of at least trans uh, of at least uh, continental philosophy, where the questions you know phenomenology are all about how the world appears to a human. Um, and it's, it's uh, very anthropocentric at the end of the day, even if there's this acknowledgement that there's a wider natural world, we still don't allow ourselves to say anything about it. So these philosophies of human access are very limited to what human beings can have access to, and they ignore the world of what Harman calls objects, and by that he just means non-human things that exist for their own sake, they have, they have their own experiences, their own ways of valuing reality, but philosophies of human access don't, don't permit us to even speculate about what those realities might be like. So just quickly from Harman, 
he says, by coming to terms with an increasing range of objects, humans do not become nihilistic princes of darkness, but actually the most sincere creatures the earth has ever seen. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is accept the fact that we need to decenter the human, and I'll show the various reasons drawing on Freud, as Travis did, these three major crises in the image of the human being, starting with Copernicus, Darwin, and then Freud. Um, we need to accept that the human being is being decentered uh, in our attempts to construct a new cosmology. Um, so I think Whitehead provides us, and, and panpsychism more generally provides us with a great way of doing that, and at the same time, time avoiding nihilism or kind of illuminative materialism. We can decenter the human and still live in an enchanted universe. In fact, I think that's the only way we can re-enchant the universe is by decentering the human. Okay, let's get beyond the title of time. Um, so I'm going to try to give a little cartoon history of the of modernity. Um, starting with uh, the Copernican the Copernican revolution, right? The, the cosmological decentering um, of the human being. Um, you know, Copernicus articulated the heliocentric model of the solar system and um, the great chain of being, the crystalline spheres of, of the medieval cosmos were, were shattered, destroyed. Um, the earth was now adrift in a universe that we weren't really sure how big it was or uh, where it came from. Um, and as Nietzsche put it, since Copernicus, humanity has been rolling from the center towards X, towards the unknown. Um, we no longer have uh, an obvious um, point of central reference or orientation. Now we're adrift in space. Um, and what's significant about this Nietzsche quote is this using this, this notion of the X, the towards X, towards the unknown, I think he's, he's ref referencing Kant, um, who would refer to his, uh, he would refer to the thing in itself, or this noumenal domain, and oppose that to a phenomenal domain, and he would often say the thing in itself equals X, as in all we can know about it is, is that it exists, we can't say anything more about it than that it exists, than that there is this realm beyond what human beings can know and access. Um, and I'm, I'm calling Kant, uh, I'm referring to his achievement as a kind of an interval that preserved for a time or protected as a, and, and as a, as a, he achieved a sort of compromise um, that allowed the human being to remain at the center. Usually, I mean, Kant referred to his own philosophical um, accomplishment as a Copernican revolution in philosophy in that, you know, if, if Copernicus decentered the earth and by proxy of the human, um, Kant, in a way, tried to recenter the human by making, you know, the objects that we think are out there, um, making it, making it clear that actually the way those objects appear is determined by our subjectivity. So he recentered the subject after the decentering of Copernicus. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that we should call Kant's revolution a Copernican revolution. It's more of a Ptolemaic reaction. It's an attempt to preserve human centrality on a metaphysical plane, even if, in terms of the physical universe, it's clear we're not at the center anymore. So this is the, Copern the, the Kantian interval, in the way that we talk about a petroleum interval. It's like it's an attempt to compromise, to buy some time, new things become possible, but it's not going to last, right? Because this guy, Darwin, um, came after Kant and revealed this story of biological evolution. Now Kant um, famously said that there would never be a Newton of the grass blade. In other words, there would never be a mechanistic explanation for life in the way that Newton and the other uh, originators of the scientific revolution were able to account for the physical world in terms of these mechanisms, these mathematical formulas. Kant didn't think we could do the same thing with life, with living organisms. And many people it suggests that, well, if Kant had lived another 50 years or so, he would have had to admit that Darwin, in fact, came up with this explanation on, based on Newtonian principles, mechanistic, purposeless principles that explained how life, as it appears before us, differentiated into all these various species that seem to fit in a purposeful way into their environments. And in fact, there's a mechanism that can account for how that could all happen in a blind way. That's the story, at least. Um, 
of this further decentering of the human. Rather than being the crown of creation, we're a, a twig at the edge of this huge bush of evolutionary creativity. And notice um, these various mass extinction events, right? Cambrian explosion 600 million years ago, and then mass extinction, mass extinction, mass extinction, five mass extinctions. And now, you know, we're on this outer rim here. So this is the center here is, is four, billion, 4 billion years ago, the origin of life roughly, and then moving along in both directions here, right? So that it's not just a uh, uni-linear sort of progression. Bacteria emerge first, and then it branches out into all this diversity, more like a bush than a, than a linear tree or something. So human beings, you know, we're over here. Many of the other species of... Um, <laughs> yes. well, many of the other species um, went extinct of, of our homo genus, right? So we survived. But now there's another mass extinction happening. So this thing that Kant tried to argue for, that the mind provides the sort of transcendental condition for how nature can appear to us, that starts to seem a little silly, you know, putting mind first and nature is just an appearance to mind. It starts to seem a little silly when you recognize this vast evolutionary history and that in fact nature has priority over mind. Mind emerged, the human mind emerged out of nature billions of years after life began, so this whole Kantian compromise doesn't seem to work anymore after Darwin. And then of course the final nail in the coffin of anthropocentrism is Freud. Um, who doesn't seem to want to stay on the screen very long, uh, <laughs> who revealed that, you know, if Copernicus decentered us in the cosmos and Darwin decentered us on the earth and in the biosphere, Freud decentered us within our own psyche. The ego was no longer the master of its own house. Um, civilization, Freud said, is uh, the result of a primal trauma and that we've repressed that trauma. And, um, all of our rationality is uh, an attempt to ultimately repress our, our primal libidinal instincts and that there is no ultimate healing from that unless we want to become animals again. So there was no, ex for Freud, there was no expression of libido that could be um, civilized in a way that would make room for, you know, genuine, un alienated, non-narcissistic, non-neurotic um, uh, consciousness. If we're civilized, we're going to be neurotic, we're going to have psychosis, it's just the way it is, and we can try to cope with that. Um, but again, the ego then, not only is the human decentered in the biosphere like Darwin suggested, but the ego within the human psyche is now also decentered. So I think after these various decenterings of the human were faced with this, we, we've arrived at a crossroads, we're faced with this sort of decision, um, either the root of the evolutionary panpsychism on the one hand, or the other root of eliminative materialism on the other hand. Um, I'm going to start with eliminative materialism and introduce some thinkers that call themselves that first, because, you know, as uh, Colin McGinn, a of, of famous philosopher nowadays who does a lot of reviews in the New York Review, review of Books put it, uh, he said that there's something vaguely hippie-ish about panpsychism. Um, something almost stoned about it. And I think, I think he's actually onto something there. So I'm going to start with eliminative materialism. If you need to go outside, if you smoke them, if you got them, come back, you'll understand panpsychism a little bit better after that. So this crossroads is important, right? What, what philosophy, what worldview we choose to articulate um, this anthro-decentric future that we cannot escape is important because as Whitehead says, a philosophical outlook is the very foundation of thought and of life. The sort of ideas we attend to and the sort of ideas which we push into the negligible background govern our hopes, our fears, our control of behavior. As we think, we live. As we think, we live. This is why the assemblage of philosophic ideas is more than a specialist study. It molds our very type of civilization. So the eliminativists, uh, not an exhaust exhaustive list here, but just a couple of contemporary, well, besides Democritus, the atomist, uh, who thought that all more complex arrangements of atoms were just 
um, sort of ephemeral emergences, but ultimately the final explanation had to be in terms of atoms, right? So he's like the first illuminativist. That's Thomas Metzinger, he's a cognitive scientist. That's Ray Brassier, he's a nihilist philosopher who I'll get more into in a moment. That's Daniel Dennett, philosopher of mind. And they, this is the dream team, Paul and Patricia Churchland, um, neurophilosophers. Metzinger wrote that book, Being No One, which he basically says that he's kind of a neuroidealist in a strange way, though he wouldn't describe himself like that. He says all of our experience as human beings is a model constructed for us by our brains. All of our experience of the outside world is a, is a model constructed by the brain, and our experience of ourselves, self-consciousness, is just a model of the model. Right? The prefrontal cortex and some other systems create a model of our internal model of reality. And so ultimately we're living in a kind of matrix, right? Um, but then he just assumes this materialistic background, but provides no way of any scientist gaining access to that through their own experience, right? So it's a weird, there's a lot of paradoxes with these illuminativists that I'm still working through. Ray Brasse's book, Nihil Unbound, um, which I'll get into more in a moment, where he's championing nihilism and disenchantment as an intellectually um, important discovery that we need to run with that and not shy away from just being nihilists. Um, we'll, I'll get more into him in a second. Consciousness Explained by Daniel Dennett, where he tries to argue that our felt experience of qualia, or the way things appear to us, sensations, pains, colors, and so on, that that's, they don't actually exist. They're just words that, and, and language games that we've evolved to play with each other, and that ultimately none of it exists. Again, this is very strange, right? Um, <laughs> Paul Churchland, Matter and Consciousness, Patricia Churchland, her new book, Touching a Nerve. Um, they're suggesting that in the future, when science continues its march of discovery and understanding of the brain, that we won't talk in terms of love and insecurity and anxiety. We'll talk in terms of neurochemicals and, and neurological systems and so on. Okay. Um, so one path that eliminativism could lead us towards is a form of transhumanism. And this is where, instead of imagining nature as in some sense ensouled, we imagine the human as in some sense machine-like, and we search for immor immortality, like um, Kurzweil wants us to do with his new, um, you know, he works for Google now on this immortality project to try to find a way to upload human consciousness into the internet so that we can live forever in a disincarnate form of pure information. Um, and the one thing about transhumanism is it's, uh, it has this very sort of dark uh, image of our human future. When we're no longer human anymore, we're, we're more like machines again. And it's, they have this perverted understanding of Teilhard de Chardin. I think a technozoic interpretation of Teilhard de Chardin. You know, and look at that image and then read this quote, the history of the living world can be reduced to the elaboration of ever more perfect eyes at the heart of the cosmos where it is always possible to discern more. You know, I wonder if that's what Tehard was talking about. <laughs> so that's the technozoic Tehard. There's an ecozoic Tehard that I think would be troubled by that. So here's Ray Brassier, one of the eliminative materialists and also one of the speculative realists. And he says, you know, curved space-time, the periodic table, natural selection, none of these are comprehensible in narrative terms. Galaxies, molecules, organisms, they're not for anything, right? Um, that's what I think of him. Um, and then he says, the disenchantment of the world is a necessary consequence of the coruscating potency, the brilliant potency of reason, and hence an invigorating vector of intellectual discovery rather than a calamitous diminishment. Uh-oh. Keynote quit unexpectedly. We cannot rely on technology, people. It turns into ideas. Download yourself on, download yourself on this computer, and then it crashes. And you're erased. Uh, so disenchantment deserves to be celebrated as an achievement of intellectual maturity, not bewailed as a debilitating impoverishment. Reality is indifferent to our existence and oblivious to the values and meanings which we would drape over it in order to make it more hospitable. Philosophy should be more than a sop to the pathetic twinge of human self-esteem. <laughs> Thinking has interests that do not coincide with those of living. 
Thinking has interests that do not coincide with those of living. Brassier articulates what he calls a logic of extinction, and he relates this to our knowledge of biological evolution. 99 or 97, somewhere in between that percent of species that have ever existed, have gone extinct. Human beings will go, even if we have this great flowering of an integral culture and an egozoic, we're, we're going to go extinct eventually. That's just what happens with life. And so Brassier dwells on that fact, articulates this logic of extinction, and says, to do philosophy, to think in a philosophic way, is to think, not just as Socrates says, as, as an attempt to learn to die, but to, to realize that one is already dead, that one does not exist, that one sense of self as an autonomous, egoic, free agent is an illusion. He thinks science has proven this, so we are just brains living out this fantasy world. Um, where we can interact morally and, and have purposes and values and so on. And I want to, instead of just dismissing this, I want to kind of live into this to, to try to um, imagine what it would be like to follow Grassi's logic of extinction to its, to its ultimate conclusion, right? So just, you know, imagine now that, that you're dead. Imagine first, just accept, live into the materialist universe where you are your brain. Now imagine you die, your brain decays. Not only are you dead, you don't even have a memory of being alive anymore if your memory is stored in here, right? So your existence is gone, your memory of even having existed is gone. What happens then? What happens when you blow out the candle of that egoic self-consciousness? I think we actually end up in a rather, you know, this is a... Alex Gray painting, a rather pan psychist universe if we fully live into that eliminativist logic of blowing out our, our ego candle. Because as soon as we blow out that candle, we dim the brightness of our own solar modern consciousness and begin to see the candle lights of all the other creatures all around us shining towards us. And we blow out our own candle, we, we begin to inhabit an enchanted, illuminated universe full of other intelligent beings that we, we couldn't notice because our own ego consciousness was so inflated, so bright, that it blinded us to these other uh, centers of consciousness all around us. So Stephen Shavira points out that, uh, contrary to what the Illuminativists are saying, it is only an anthropocentric prejudice to assume that things cannot be lively and active and mindful on their own without us. Illuminativist arguments thus start out by presupposing human exceptionalism. So they presuppose that value, meaning, purpose is all somehow produced in the human brain. It doesn't exist out there in the world. It's a fluke of evolution and emerging our species on accident. When our species goes extinct, value, purpose, narrative, all that is also gone, dissolved. But this is already, it's just presupposing human specialness, human uniqueness. And that uh, there's a need to recognize the um, anthropocentric prejudice that that, that implies. Um, so here are the panpsychists, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, and using photographs instead of names makes it very obvious that these are all white men. Um, this is Thales, this is Anaxagoras, this is Giordano Bruno, uh, Spinoza, Leibniz, Schopenhauer, Schelling, um, that's... Um, Haeckel, Ernst Haeckel, the German biologist, that's Fechner, that's Henri Bergson, that's William James, Pierre de Chardin, and then contemporary panpsychists, um, that's uh, Galen Strawson, David Skurbina wrote a book on the history of panpsychism, panpsychism in the West. He also happens to have a long correspondence with the Unabomber, talking about the effects of technology on society, really interesting guy. Uh, Freya Matthews, um, Christoph Koch, who worked with Francis Crick, initially starting this research project in the 90s to explain consciousness in a reductive way as a product of neural interaction. They eventually came to realize that they couldn't actually, they couldn't explain it that way. Christoph Koch became a, a panpsychist, and in his, the papers he was writing at the very end of his life, Francis Crick started to think of the brain as a radio receiver. So, interesting that neuroscientific research would lead them to a sort of panpsychic perspective. Rupert Sheldrake, um, Isabel Stenger is a Whiteheadian panpsychist, and Graham Harmon, who I quoted at the beginning. Left off that list, of course, Alfred North Whitehead. Um, unlike Brassier, who severed the connection between life and thought, um, Brassier said, again, that thinking has interests that do not coincide with the interests of life. Whitehead 
disagrees. The whitehead value, purpose, meaning are intrinsic to the universe. We have no right, he says, to deface the value experience, which, which is the very essence of the universe. Existence in its own nature is the upholding of value intensity. And he goes on to say, the key notion from which the construction of a cosmology should, be, should start is that the energetic activity considered in physics is the emotional intensity ent entertained in life. So there's a, there's a continuity between physics and life. Physical energy is pulsation of emotion, of feeling. There's no gap between the merely physical objective in the world and the subjective, um, you know, phenomenological life world that we live in. Neither physical nature nor life can be understood unless we fuse them together as essential factors in the composition of really real things whose interconnections and individual characters constitute the universe. Um, biology is the study of the larger organi organisms, whereas physics is the study of the smaller organisms. Um, so then instead of physics being the most general science, ecology becomes the most general science, because even subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, galaxies, are organisms evolving in ecosystems, um, forming symbiotic relationships, and then outside the relationships of those organisms, there's nothing. Um, you know, Whitehead wants to understand physical law, as, as John was saying, being more like habit that emerges from the interaction of these individual organisms. The laws aren't imposed from the outside, they emerge from the dynamics and the decisions that those organisms themselves make. Um, finally, these unities of existence, these occasions of experience, the really real things which in their collective unity compose the evolving universe, ever plunging into the creative advance. Um, so this is evolutionary panpsychism. This is not just a sort of pantheism um, where there's one finished unity which from God's perspective is eternal. Um, it, is, it is a creative advance, rather. It's, it's not um, a finished whole. It's an ongoing uh, death and rebirth um, perinatal experience. The whole of the universe is going through that um, death, rebirth mystery and there's no final form that we can point to um, and unpack mathematically for, to discover some theory of everything that can account for what there is in, in, based on some eternal principles because everything is in process, everything is moving, um, everything is growing together and dying together and being born together. Um, And in that context, then, the problem of evolution is the development of enduring harmonies of enduring shapes of value, which merge into higher attainments of things beyond themselves. Aesthetic attainment is interwoven into the texture of realization. So the last thing I want to say is, is about that last sentence there. Aesthetic attainment is interwoven into the texture of realization. Instead of that classical dichotomy between appearance and reality, in Whitehead's panpsychic evolutionary universe, um, Appearance and reality are not diametrically opposed. Um, you know, as Brassier was saying in, in one of the earlier slides, he was saying that human beings drape purpose and value and meaning on the outside world, like a, like a, a thin veneer or a veil. Um, you know, it's, it's a mere appearance, in other words. For Whitehead, appearance is reality. Um, aesthetic attainment is <laughs> interwoven in the texture of realization, right? So, the, the faintest puff of existence in far off empty space, he says, is already the realization of some value, of some intensity of feeling that has a purpose and a, and a, a meaning in itself. And that initial puff of existence then ramifies and evolves and develops into more complex forms of value, meaning, and purpose. But we, there's no such thing as existence without value from Whitehead. So the panpsychist wager, this, the panpsychist speculation, is very different than eliminated materialist wager, which suggests in a very anthropocentric way that all meaning and purpose is produced in the skull somehow. I haven't ever seen an explanation of how that's done exactly, but that's what they claim. So I'm done. I think I have a few minutes um, for a conversation. David, who has the mic? Oh.
working. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you, Matt, so much. You really got right to the heart of it. And it's so good to present it. It's really amazing. Yeah. I appreciate that. So, it made it clear, I really appreciate the, the, the diverging roads. Mm -hmm. Although it seems to me like the gravity behind the, the, this um, movement is so large that these things can't so I guess my question is, how how do we bring this together? Or do you have know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, and presuming we can just use breath work. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, just like how what have you thought about the different from the from the music dialogue? Yeah. I think there, I have more of an interest in dialoguing with really hardcore nihilists like Brassie than I do with people like um, Rick Kurzweil and the Transhumanists because they're still, they're not nihilists, they're buying into the myth of religion. It's just capital, techno capitalist progress and the progress. They're totally on board with that idea. Um, whereas Brassier recognizes that that's just another um, myth that needs to be disenchanted. That's a form of disenchantment, I don't want to call it. And so Brassier is totally demolishing every possible humanity we can give to our experience, including. The capitalist world, we can do better, advance society, technologically, make more profit, and raise a better life, as the story goes. Accept his own myth. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Accept his own myth. That's right. Heroic. Identify with the heroic yeah. confrontation with total values. It's just one person. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is why the same things that Rick said about psychedelics and astrology mm -hmm. is that and psychism, modern mind. Um, of losing its sole source of agency and recognizing that this world is what it is. Um, democracy is messy. To spiritualize, is it to recognize this, this spiritual value and democratize the spirituality into all creatures is um, you know, a lot of other ways to accomplish that. So it's, it's a lot of Until five or so, time for the video, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah thank you. I really loved that. Um, and also, just related to what David said, this idea of there was kind of this fork in the road and how he was talking about this gravity behind it. You know, he brought it up himself. I feel like a lot of the gravity behind it is just the socioeconomic thrust of history during that course of time, the Industrial Revolution, and the way that we. You know, uh, we always talk about it in a way that we were able to dominate matter in a way we never were able to before. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that is, we, you know, multiplied the lifespan of the average human being. You know, and we produced tremendous, tremendous revolution, the likes of which human history has never known. Of, of, of unbelievable abundance. Of course, there's a gigantic shadow side to that as well. You know, which is becoming larger and larger and larger every single year to the point where we're just accelerating off the edge of a cliff, yeah. you know, and so I'm wondering how much of this um, paradigmatic shift that happen, has to happen in human consciousness um, has to do with the way that, you know, the way that the socioeconomics of this is also just heading off a cliff, you know, what's the dialectic there, you know? Yeah. I mean, a couple of things came to mind when you talked about the way we've been dominating matter. And I thought something I didn't get to go into with the side of a lot of white male kind of psychists was that what, I, what I've come to realize is that part of this paradigm shift is having to be moving away from patriarchy to re embracing the, the, the goddess um, archetype and the, the, the goddess herself as a real ontological presence that we lost with the rise of patriarchy. And that Panpsychism is kind of what happens when white men are have their ego shattered by the all-encompassing goddess. That's what my, white men do when that happens to the um, <laughs> 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 recognize it. Yeah. As, a, as a sort of symptom of that dynamic, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the tradition is starting to diversify more nowadays in a lot of female philosophers like panpsychists. It's not a mistake. It's not Coincidence. So it's, a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, it's, 
it's the individual ego that allows the capitalist social economic machine to continue. And through various means that we all talk about all the time, I think that ego can be shattered and forced to recognize this larger intelligence and community of intelligences that surround us. That's probably what things happen. Thank you, uh, Matt. That was a great presentation. Um, I really agree with you that uh, in terms of pants like and that it's, it's a sound foundation. Um, and uh, I think we need to extend uh, yeah, the spiritual dignity to, to all beings, including the Earth and all further outside of the Earth. Um, I guess I was curious, um, I want to push back a little bit. And, and that for me, I, I, I see an inherent conflict with the tradition, with some versions of pants like and that, that in saying that. All mind, uh, all matter has mind. Yet life, it, it took 10 million years for life to emerge, and then mind came out of that. That's, that's to me, it seems like that's saying that the first 10 million years was mind. Was so I was wondering if you could speak to that, and, uh, and maybe just what your thoughts around that. Yeah, it's a, I think there's a, a shift we have to do in terms of how we understand emergence, the emergence of life, the emergence of mind, and the panpsychic cosmology. Emergence doesn't mean the emergence of um, totally ontologically novel um, capacities. So in instead, it's just a higher order, a, a more intense version of the same that had already been present. So you know, um, from the very first primordial flight and forth, the energy that was present there was already, in some sense, um, there for itself, it had an experience of what it was like to be energy radiating. Um, it wasn't conscious and reflective, of, it wasn't having thoughts like, oh, I'm energy expanding in this direction. No, it was more just like fully immersed in the experience. I mean, one of the things that we have to do um, to understand that psychism is we really get to the sort of in a process of, through a process of alchemical distillation, boil down human consciousness, which is a very complex form of experience, to its more fundamental levels, so that we're just dealing with very rudimentary and, for that reason, kind of vague and indistinct emotional vectors that are constantly flowing into us. We recognize things that move um, the atmosphere, the emotional atmosphere that pervades our experience. And sort of, you know, one aspect of decentering the human ego is recognizing that the vast majority of our daily and the experience obviously is not conscious and there are non-conscious forms of experience. And so matter, even before it was alive, had a non-conscious form of experience. Life then becomes a little bit more of an intense realization of that experience and the mind even more so. And so there are emergences of more intense forms of experience, but it's not like a radical break where you have to suggest some kind of a miracle where life came out of dead matter or mind came out of completely fundamentally non-experiential material systems. Brian you know, the I think it's on but By, by decentering the human, you're, you're basically saying panpsychism kind of decenters the human. That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Okay, I have a giant pushback question. Cool. But it's going to take us 15 minutes or more. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to just, just ask the question and we can talk about it later so everyone knows what the challenge is? Like, uh, uh, the archetypal astrological perspective uh, does the opposite. It decenters the human being in a meaningful place in the cosmos. And we discuss in the radical myth of speculation classes the, you know, the, the, the power of the self-reflective consciousness that we have is reshaping the landscape of the planet. And we have to negotiate that. And the limited materialism is the direction it's heading. Okay? Um, but the archetypal astrological actually recenters us in a meaningful way 
that actually empowers us and gives us a, an intense amount of responsibility to actually steward in some way, not utilitarianly steward, but Let's talk more about it. Okay. It is a 15, more than 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I got it. Go ahead, Dr. Now, one reason to study eliminative materialism is to get better at um, presenting ideas because we get by some of the focus. That's one way, yeah. and that's important. Another way is, is to actually um, you know, create a new synthesis, something that seems stronger than evolutionary panpsychism. I mean, that may not even be a possibility, but I'm curious as to how you look at it. A new synthesis that... Well, I'm not, I mean, in other words, are you studying eliminated uh, materialism in order to get better, more skillful at presenting evolutionary panpsychism? Or do you find yourself actually coming up with ideas that are actually stronger because of your immersion? Yeah. In Besides... Whitehead and Schelling and Whiteheadians and Schellingians, I don't like to read people I agree with, but I'd rather read people I totally disagree with. Because, yeah, it forces you to really point the arguments and, and to point them in the right direction so that you're, you're responding to the claims that, you know, the people who aren't thinking the same way as you are making. Because, you know, philosophy is not just about communicating to the public about what's true or whatever. It's also, you know, um, an ongoing process of, of self-discovery and but at the same time you know and we're concerned with discovering some kind of the truth that it doesn't matter what people's opinions about which one is true we hope this philosophy can say something that's true regardless of anyone's opinion about it but at the same time we need to you know as Theo was saying we need to like make our ideas relevant to the larger world and the course of civilization speak to the present moment and I think the present moment is such that when we get a materialism and transhumanism uh, are at the forefront of the public consciousness. And if, if we don't respond to that, they're gonna they're gonna invent the new story that they're weakened. Um, one more if it's quick and then we'll make way for Marcella. Um, so maybe just a quick statement of the idea that, that possibly what one helpful way as scholars to talk about this is to to consider the conflation of an experience in like data consciousness with the urge to craft culture and self and society. And that if we take those apart and disentangle them and, and and explain those experiences that stepping in through the red door into the imaginal realm and having an experience of David consciousness quality would be very disorienting to someone who is trying to evaluate the cosmology you know, for the culture and what would be best. And if they understood it better, that you know, we are a species of species and that are these experiences that will feel magical, but it's an opportunity to be relational mm. and to examine our real values. Mm. Yeah. I agree with that. All right, more, more conversation can be had later, but I'm going to call it quits. Thanks. Thanks.